Hi, and uh, welcome back to this sequence of videos on support vector machines. So in the previous video, we rewrote the support vector machine problem of finding a maximum margin separating hyperplane into the following optimization problem where we want to choose the minimum over uh, a W and a B, where W is the normal vector of a hyperplane and B is uh, a bias of a half squared norm of W and subject to uh, these constraints here. And we argued that if you solve this optimization problem, find the best W and B, this would give you uh, the separating hyperplane with the largest margin uh, to the nearest data points. Okay. So we also said that uh, this was a convex optimization problem in the sense that the objective function is convex and also these constraints here are in some sense convex constraints. And uh, so what we'll do in this video is that we will introduce some basic techniques for solving uh, convex optimization problems that will give us a lot of insights into uh, this concrete uh, optimization problem here. So these constraints here are linear. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just look at a very general method that can solve optimization problems with this form, but also other uh, problems than this concrete one. Okay, so in general, general convex optimization problems look problem looks like this. Uh, you want to find the minimum over some x, which can be a whole vector of variables of some function f of x. And then you have some constraints uh, that you have to satisfy. You have a whole bunch of them up to n constraints. Each of them tells us that some function gi of x has to be at most zero. Uh, and this is a general problem. If the f and the gi's are convex functions, then this is a general convex optimization problem. And we'll see that the previous support vector machine problem fits into this framework. Uh, but for now, and for the rest of this video, we'll just study this general convex optimization problem. Okay, so minimize some function of x. We have to choose the minimizing x or find the minimizing x subject to constraints that tell us that some gi of x is at most zero for a convex function gi. Okay. And this optimization problem, the one that we're really interested in solving, is the one that we will typically refer to as the primal optimization problem. This is the one that we want to solve. Uh, and to solve it, we're going to introduce what's called the generalized Lagrangian of this optimization problem. So what is it? So the generalized Lagrangian is, a, I guess, a function that takes two inputs, x and alpha. So x should, I guess, be thought of as the x up here. And alpha is a vector of parameters where you have one entry in alpha for each of the constraints in the primal optimization problem. And this generalized Lagrangian then takes the, the, the form that you have f of x, but then you add a sum over all the original constraints, take each of these alpha i's and multiply on to each of these values g i of x. And each of these alpha i's are typically called Lagrange multipliers. So this is the generalized Lagrangian. And with this uh, generalized Lagrangian that we have here, uh, we can look at this quantity here that we'll denote by theta sub p of x. So it's a function of a single argument x, kind of like f is up here. And the value that it takes is that for any given x, the value that you get for this function is, well, you have to choose the maximum over all alphas where all these Lagrange multipliers alpha i are non-negative. Okay, so it's the maximum over all choices of alpha of the value of this generalized Lagrangian at x comma alpha. Okay, so it's a function of one variable x, and the value it takes is that you choose the maximum over all alphas of this generalized Lagrangian at x comma alpha. Okay, so let's try to have a look at uh, this function here. What values does it take? And let's try to understand it. So first, we can try to look at what if x is an input that violates one of these constraints in the original optimization problem, like right? one of these gi of x is less than or equal to zero. Let's say it, it violates one of them, meaning that there is at least one constraint, one of the primal constraints, where to the jth one of them, where gj of x is greater than zero. Right? What happens then to the value of this function here, the theta sub p? So theta sub p, again, is the maximum over all choices of alpha, where the alphas have to be greater than or equal to zero of f of x, plus the sum of all these uh, primal constraints, gi of x times alpha i. Now, this is a maximum over all alphas. And if we had one of those constraints that are violated, say the jth one that is strictly greater than zero in value, then maximizing over alpha would, have to, would mean that you take that alpha, the alpha j, and put it to infinity. Right, so we let it go towards infinity, and then because gj of x is greater than zero, we have a violation, then 
this function here becomes infinite, right? So it, it basically goes to infinity, right? So, okay, so for X that violates a primal constraint, this function here takes basically an infinite value. On the other hand, right, if we look at one of, what if we have an X that satisfies all the primal constraints, meaning that for every primal constraint, GJ of X, it, where we have GJ of X is no more than zero. Then this maximization here, right, because we have to set them non-negatively, each of these uh, Lagrange multipliers. So the best we can do, since all of these are less than equal to zero and we're maximizing, we have to set them all to zero. If we set them all to zero, then the whole value of this function is just equal to f of x, right? So we get the original function f of x that we have up here in the primal optimization problem. Okay. So this is kind of interesting two observations that we have here that this function theta sub p of x is infinite if x violates a primal constraint and it is exactly equal to uh, the primal uh, value of your primal objective value if x satisfies all the primal constraints. Okay. So what this means is that if I now consider this uh, optimization problem, you find the minimum over x of theta sub p of x which is basically the minimum over X of the maximum over alpha of uh, this generalized Lagrangian at X comma alpha, then this uh, optimization problem has exactly the same optimal solution as the primal problem up here, right? Because, well, any solution, if you choose an X that violates a primal constraint, then you get infinity and you're minimizing over X. So you have to choose a feasible solution. And if you're minimizing over all the feasible solution, of course, you will get the same uh, objective value as you have up here in the primal optimization problem. Okay. So, right. So what does this mean, right? So we have this minimum over X of theta sub P of X. And this basically has this, it's the same optimization problem as this primal optimization problem here. So basically what we achieve by doing this is that, well, if I can minimize this function here, the status of P of X, then I basically turned the whole thing into an unconstrained optimization problem. Right? I don't have these subject to anymore. Uh, well, maybe a little bit still because I'm requiring that all these Lagrange multipliers are greater than or equal to zero, but it's a little bit simpler than the one we have up here at least. And it's, it's basically an unconstrained optimization problem. It's just the function itself that we're minimizing at least over here. Um, it's basically, well, at least the first formulation, there's only one variable and there's no constraints, right? So, so this is an, an unconstrained optimization problem. Uh, it's just a different function that we're minimizing. Right? So that's great. Now, of course, the, the downside of the tricky part is that in this, if we unfold it and we have this maximum over alpha as well, right? We introduced also these alpha variables in some sense and, uh, and a maximum in this expression. So it's a more complicated function uh, than just this f of x up here but we've gotten rid of the constraints in some sense. Okay, so, so that's the, the positive uh, thing about it. And uh, now we introduce the notation that we call P star, uh, which we call the primal value. It's just the minimum over X of theta sub P of X. So that's the primal value. And it's basically the optimal value of the uh, general primal optimization problem that we're interested in solving. Right? That's the primal value. Okay. Now, what we do now is that uh, we introduce also what we call a dual problem. So up here again, right, we have the generalized Lagrangian, the primal problem, if you will, where we just have to, where we have this function theta sub P of X and the primal value was the minimum over X of theta sub P of X, which was this minimum over X, maximum over alpha of this value of the generalized Lagrangian L of X comma alpha. Now for the dual problem, which we call theta sub D, D for dual, this function here, theta sub d, is a function of only alpha. Okay, so it should be thought of as up here where we have a function of only x. Here we have a function of only alpha, and the value it takes is the minimum over all x's of L of x comma alpha. And so up here we had the primal one was the maximum over all alphas. If you want to know the value at a given x, you have to maximize over alpha. Here, if you want to know the value at a given alpha, you have to minimize over x. Then we also introduce the dual value which is then the maximum over all alphas, where the alphas are constrained to be non-negative, of the, this theta sub d of alpha. If we unfold it, right, we get the maximum over all alpha, where the alphas are non-negative, the minimum over all x of the value of this generalized Lagrangian L of x comma alpha. This is called the dual value. And basically, you can see here the primal value and the dual value 
the expression for them, the only thing that's different is the order of the min and the max, right? So we're still minimizing over X in both of them. We're still maximizing over alpha in both of them. Uh, we just flip the order of the min and the max. Okay. So, and that we take on this generalized Lagrangian. And the observation that we'll try to, I'll try to convince you about just shortly is that this dual value down here is always less than or equal to uh, the primal value. So I'll try to give you a proof by, by picture of this, this fact. Okay. So let's try to see this. So in one case, we have the maximum. So this is the, the dual, right? We have the maximum over all these alphas, the minimum over all the x's. And I'm claiming this is no more than the minimum over the x first and then the maximum over alpha. So let's try to uh, prove this by picture, at least convince you that this is true. All right. So I guess what we can draw is we can draw like a table of all the values that this generalized Lagrangian L can take. So it's indexed by A and it's indexed by x. It has values at every point of evaluation. And so let's try to relate what is it that these two things are, are saying based on this picture here. So let's say we've already fixed alpha, right? So alpha fixes a row. Then if we fixed alpha, then we have to take the minimum over x of L of x comma alpha, right? So for given row alpha, the inner thing here tells us to take the smallest value in row alpha. And now this whole expression here on the left-hand side, right, we're basically saying, well, you have to choose the, the row alpha that maximizes the minimum value in that row. So it's the largest minimum value in a row. That's what the left-hand side is, the largest minimum value in a row. Okay, so if we look at the right-hand side instead, and we just say, okay, let's say we already fixed the column X, then this expression here say, take the maximum value in that column, right? So you're maximizing over all the alphas of L of X comma alpha. So it's the largest value in column X. And the whole thing here then, because we're minimizing on the outside is the smallest maximum value in a column. Okay, so the left-hand side is the largest minimum value in a row and the right-hand side is the smallest maximum value in a column. Let's try to show that indeed they satisfy this inequality. So, okay, the largest minimum value in a row. So if you look at all the rows here, the first one, the minimum value is zero. Here, the minimum value is three. Here, the minimum value is one, one, and two. So the row with the largest minimum value is the red one here. And that minimum value is three, right? That's the largest minimum value of a row. On the other hand, let's look at the columns, the minimum of all columns, so the smallest maximum value in a column. The first column has a maximum value of nine. The second has a maximum value of seven. The third one has a max value of five. This has a max value of eight. And the last one has a max value of nine. Okay, so again, the largest minimum value in a row in this example here is three. The smallest maximum value in a column here is five. So indeed three is less than or equal to five. So the same is at least true here, but let's try to argue that this is always going to be the case. So, you know, maybe we could call this column here X star, the one that obtains the smallest maximum value in a column. Now, what we observe is that every single row of the matrix here uh, will intersect this column. And so every row intersects this column here. So if I look at that row, it has an entry in that column. Right? So for instance, this entry is three. If I look at the next row, the entry would be five. At the top row, the entry would be four. And that entry is, of course, less than or equal to the maximum in column X star, right? Because the maximum is the largest. So that entry is less than or equal to the maximum. But what we're choosing in the row is the minimum value in that row. So, of course, the minimum value in a row is no more than the value in the intersection with X star. And that value is no more than the maximum in X star. So, therefore, this inequality holds. Good. So... What we have now is that the dual value here is always less than or equal to the primal value. Because it's basically because the dual is a maximum over alpha and minimum over x, whereas the primal is the minimum over x and maximum over alpha. Now, what we'll try to exploit here, or the basic idea is that, well, if it happened that the dual value was equal to the primal value, right? If this was actually an equality instead of a less than or equal to, then what we could do is we could basically solve the dual problem instead of the primal problem, right? Because they had the same optimal value and, and you know, so then we can try to, to solve this one instead. And this is what we'll end up doing. And 
for a lot of reasons, uh, this would be very useful. Okay. So when can, would it actually be the case that the dual value is equal to the primal value? And here the main result is that if this f function up here, the f, the, the objective value in the original optimization problem, and all these gi's are convex functions, and also it holds that all these constraints gi are actually strictly feasible, which means that there actually is an x, you can find a solution x that actually satisfies all these constraints. Remember the original constraint says that gx, gi of x has to be less than or equal to zero. That's the original formulation of the optimization problem. Well, if there is an x that actually strictly satisfies all these inequalities, so meaning that they're all strictly less than zero, uh, then the primal and dual value are actually equal. Okay, so this is the main result. Uh, that we will we'll be using. Okay, so if f and gi's are convex functions, which is what we assumed and which was the case for the support vector machine optimization problem, and if it turns out that these constraints gi are strictly feasible, then the primal value is equal to the dual value. But there's actually even more properties that we can use and that we will uh, use for support vector machines in, in particular. And that is the so-called uh, KKT conditions. And the KKT conditions tells us something about uh, what the optimal solution might look like. And in particular, it tells us that under these uh, constraints up here, there is actually an optimal solution consisting now of, of an X star and an alpha star for this generalized Lagrangian. So this is an optimal solution that satisfy all these properties down here. Right. So if I take this generalized Lagrangian and compute the partial derivative of it with respect to XI, and I evaluate it at this optimal solution, then I get zero. And this holds for all the partial derivatives. So it's kind of like saying, I guess for a convex function in a local minimum, all the partial derivatives are zero. Indeed, one can find such an optimal solution here uh, where all the partial derivatives are zero at this optimal solution. Okay, that makes sense. Then the next property we have here uh, says that, well, if I look at any one of these original constraints, and I look at this alpha i star in the optimal solution times the g i of x star in this of where x star is this optimal solution, then this is zero, this product. And this one is important, it's a little special because what it tells us is that, well, it's an optimal solution. And what it tells us is that, well, if this um, Lagrange multiplier alpha i is strictly greater than zero, then because we have this equality, this has to equal zero, it must be the case that gi of x star is equal to zero, right? And if we remember, uh, the original optimization problem says that uh, all gi of x's have to be at most zero. Well, if it's equal to zero, then in some sense it's an active constraint. It, it means that basically it's a constraint that has been pushed as far as it can. Um, it's satisfied basically with equality, this less than equal to. Okay, so basically it, it, this is, will, be the case that if these alpha i's are indeed greater than zero, then it must be the case that it, this alpha i corresponds to a constraint that is satisfied with equality being an active constraint in some sense. Okay. It's also the case that all these alpha i's are indeed greater than or equal to zero, which was uh, a requirement that we had. And all these uh, inequalities are satisfied that all these gi of x stars are less than or equal to zero, right? which was, uh, again, well, there was a requirement of an optimal solution. Okay, so these are nice properties to know. Uh, this is indeed something that is satisfied for an optimal solution X star, alpha star. Okay. So basically what all of this means and what we'll be using in the next video on support vector machines is that, well, for our support vector machines, like this F and the GIs will be convex functions. And we'll just have to talk a little bit. We'll see that indeed actually these constraints will be strictly feasible. Um, and so, Indeed, the dual value will be equal to the primal value, and then we, which means we can solve the dual problem. And moreover, while solving it, we can assume that the optimal solution satisfies all these KKT conditions. Okay. So this was a very quick crash course on convex optimization. And now we'll try to go back to support vector machines and use these things that we just derived.